Hello, and welcome back to Parlay. This prompt was written by Free William. Hope you'll enjoy listening. It's about a song or a music video, piece of performance art, called Hi Ren by Ren. And I just realized that it's styled as Ren. Hi Ren is the song name. Um, anyway, uh, I, you, I won't have linked that. You can look it up very easily if you would like to watch it. Uh, Free William says very simply, I invoke Parlay. You may have already seen or heard Hi Ren, just in case. Here it is, it was linked. And I think it's striking in a lot of ways and would love to hear your thoughts. That's it. Cool. Um, so I have like a structure in mind for how I'll talk about it. I think it's probably appropriate going into this parlay to give you a bit of a warning that this deals with subjects of mm, what I'm going to describe as the dark side of the mind, but it could be construed a few ways, uh, as well as topics of depression and suicide. If you don't want to grapple with those things right now, you probably shouldn't watch this parlay and I would more strongly recommend not watching that music video right now. Uh, but I thought it was pretty cool, so I'm excited to get to talk with you all about it. There are two primary things I want to talk about, and I will also briefly discuss just what I saw, uh, a sort of quick and dirty review. But then there are two primary topics I want to discuss. The first one is about uh, like format and structure, how the piece uses the, what it is, which is kind of a hybrid of a music video and performance art, um, and how it's, uh, structured, you know, like musically, how is it structured? Uh, but also uh, anyway, I'll talk about it to get its point across. Um, I think it's using those things in so to me, somewhat novel ways, like not doing something I had seen much before that I thought was reasonably effective, pretty interesting use of a music video, uh, to do something specific. And then the second thing I want to talk about is how it uses lyrics. Uh, the writing of this piece is it's extremely literal. Uh, there is n almost zero metaphor. <laughs> um, there's maybe one larger allegory, but it's 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 very on the nose. Um, this is not a piece that you will have any difficulty um, penetrating. You're not going to listen to it and like not know what it's about. Uh, and I think that has several effects, which I think are really interesting. So we'll talk about them. Uh, I will, I'm not going to get into this too much because um, we only have so much time. But uh, Mr. Foot, uh, true parlay grandmaster Foot, uh, a fellow parlay patron, uh, commented on the video and mentioned, you know, there's like a lack of subtlety and perhaps imagination that comes from plainly speaking your point. Um, but then there's a voice of empathy that says, does that matter if the audience actually listens to what you have to say? Um, I would go further. I think that it is potentially reaching an unexpectedly unserviced audience to literally just say the thing you have to say. As a student of poetry and English more broadly myself, I know how inex uh, inaccessible, unintentionally inaccessible sometimes, uh, writing things in what seems like relatively plain poetic verse can be and literally saying them, hitting the audience over the face with them, may serve a surprisingly larger audience than you would at first think um, that is not always served. So I, I want to talk about that. I think I think that is a good thing that this piece does. Uh, it has drawbacks. It has various effects. So we'll talk about them. Cool. Um, okay, so yes, I would like to briefly talk about just what I saw. So it's about a nine-minute video, which immediately caught my eye. You know, if something is going to be for a commercial radio or basically any distribution, for various reasons, it's going to need to be around three to five minutes. Uh, and I would say shorter nowadays, like I'm not a, a, an expert in this part of uh, entertainment industry. So it's it's probably gotten shorter and I should say like two to four minutes. Kind of like how movies usually want to be like within a certain length. There are various reasons for this that we don't necessarily need to get into, but just as a taste, because I think it's important, you know, the movie theater won't be able to do so many showings if your movie is three hours long. If it's two hours long, you can imagine how they could fit more people in. And if the movies aren't going to be more expensive for showing longer, which some places they are, that has happened to be before, you know, they'll make less money if the piece is longer. You'll hear less songs on the radio if they're individually longer. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that that's bad in as clear of a way, but it does have various drawbacks. And for people that leave things on, if you don't like something, you're more likely to click off if it's longer. I, I think that is a simple problem, uh, though I really like pieces that are like medium in length. This isn't a nine minute song, though. 
it's maybe about seven and a half minutes by my notes uh, of a song. And that is still about twice as long as that standard length. And then Ren, the artist, directly addresses the audience. I would not view that address as part of the piece or like acting. It is scripted, you know, he thought of something to say and then said it. It's not something you'd say in normal conversation. It's not candid if you wanted to think of it that way. But I, I would like to give the benefit of the doubt that it is literally just him talking to the audience. It's not really part of the performance, in my opinion. Um, at the very least, I believe it is separate. I don't have much to say about that part either, uh, though we'll probably talk about it in part two. Okay, so the structure of the piece more broadly. Um, it's a it's a, an acu amped acoustic guitar and vocal piece. I would describe the lyrics as a spoken word and a bit of singing with a little bit of sort of acapella-esque flavor as well. Um, and it's a music video, which is what I would say is in a music uh, music theater or like performance art type setting. Um, we're in a, a sort of rundown building with uh, cracked paint, you know, concrete or whatever walls with a few janky lamps lighting the space. And Ren, the performing artist and the central character of the piece, comes in on a wheelchair uh, in a hospital gown wearing socks and also wearing a, a pair of earrings and a what I would describe as a lightly punk head cut, haircut head cut. Uh, it's kind of like my haircut if you buzz the sides a little bit and push your hair forward a little. It's, it's different, but it's not dissimilar. What I would describe as a light punkish aesthetic. So um, he, is, he is in what I would describe as a costume, even though it's barely a costume because the idea of the piece is that it's himself, like that this is him. Uh, but I would still describe it as a prop to some extent. This music video makes use of the setting and the what I would call costume um, as props. I would also argue the acoustic guitar as a prop uh, in the pursuit of getting the message of the song across. In a way that a lot of music videos, uh, it's not that they don't, but they just don't do that in the same way, you know? A lot of music videos are there because they're because a music video, you know what I mean? Because they're there. <laughs> um, this one, I would argue, does significantly contribute to the message of the song. Uh, and as it begins, we see a little bit more of why that is. So uh, it begins with a, a little acoustic guitar solo, pretty cool guitar solo. Um, and of course, because I know this is an abnormal length song and the artist is dressed this way and then proficiently plays an acoustic guitar solo i'm expecting that the format of the piece musically is going to be not regular it's probably not going to be verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus or whatever um, it's probably going to be something different and it is uh, we get a solo we get some acapella or however you describe that and then the lyric part of the song begins and the gimmick of this first part is that Ren is talking with themselves. I'm going to refer to these as hope and despair Ren, I guess. Uh, we have hope Ren facing one way and despair Ren facing the other way. And they do use slight versions of the same voice. Ren is using a, a, a slight version of their voice to speak to each party. Uh, and they have a conversation. I will talk about this more in part two, but again, it is a very direct conversation. You're not going to have difficulty figuring out that it's like voices inside the same head. That is quite explicit. This is not a, a impenetrable piece in that way. Uh, they talk and go back and forth, and it's conversational in the sense that uh, Ren will atmospherically not play the guitar constantly, as sometimes it's necessary to emote with their hands or like say things in a funny voice or something. Um, it is spoken word or, or a little bit close to the tradition of rap, but I would describe it as spoken word. Um, and this is used, uh, I would say, superseding the music. The, the acoustic guitar playing and the set and all these things are what I would describe as the background for this conversation that is being conducted in spoken word. Uh, this happens for a good couple of minutes of the song, and they're having a conversation. They're having a conversation in what I would describe as a more casual setting. It's a conflict. Basically, Hope Ren feels like things are going better and doesn't want Despair Ren coming around anymore. And Despair Ren says, who are you kidding? You know, that's, that's not a thing. You're not getting anywhere. Uh, it comes to a head when Hope Ren says, you know, I don't need you anymore. And Despair Ren says, again, I had 
mentioned, I think, a good content warning for this piece about depression and suicide. If you want to kill me, you've got to kill you too. And the central conceit of the song is thus struck, basically that to try to push this voice in your head away is an ultimately lifelong and futile endeavor, and it may be more fruitful to find a way to live in harmony with it and channel it instead. The song represents this fairly literally by having a structure that is essentially verse, verse. And after about the halfway point of the song, four minutes and 30 seconds or so, despair and hope ran kind of combo together, though I would describe it as being more despair Ren speaking, um, who identifies themselves as not merely a voice inside your head making you feel sad, but more as the embodiment of human suffering <laughs> and woe uh, that has lived for you know eternity and can never be destroyed. Uh, this is, again, meant to kind of make the conceit of the piece that you, you can't simply not be depressed. Like, that isn't a thing. Um, this is something that struck home for me very quickly because I have always felt this way. Uh, you can't just not be depressed. If, you, if you're paying attention, you would be depressed about what's going on around us right now. So it's not a matter of whether you are or are not depressed. It's a matter of perspective. You could reframe it or behave differently with that information. You don't have to just be depressed because things are depressing, but you can't just not be upset about those things without being ignorant of them, which has its own problems. Uh, that's a little bit of me, folks, uh, but I would argue the piece is saying something quite similar, if not literally the same thing as that. Um, though Ren's advice at the very end ends up being a little bit different than what I normally would have given. Uh, I normally wouldn't have given any advice. Uh, so uh, having the second verse be a union of the two voices, no longer left and right for hope and despair, Ren, but center for the combination of the two. And a little moment at the beginning of verse two happens where uh, the song kind of restarts, and it, it briefly sounds as though Ren is writing the song right now to kind of imply that the verse 1 was a discussion while the song was being developed, and verse 2 is like, this is the final cut of the song after that conflict happened, and I, Ren, came to peace with it, and now here it is, which is pretty cool. I thought that was a lot of fun. And again, I think seeing someone in person, seeing his body language and mannerisms helps with that. You could enjoy this, like it wouldn't be like bad if you listened to it alone, but I think having video uh, meaningfully contributed to it being good. Uh, it, it helped add impact to those things. Um, he did a pretty good job, like doing some very mild acting, in, in my opinion, as well. Um, I thought that was solid. Um, and then so we get the verse again, and the song concludes as it began with uh, some a cappella or voice intonations, voice as an instrument, and uh, an acoustic guitar ditty. Uh, so this it has this beautiful symmetry where it's kind of verse-verse, and it also begins and then ends with a sort of similar motif. Uh, pretty cool. So you can see, as I was saying in my, my sort of part one thing that I've mostly finished now, how the format of the piece helps communicate its message. You can't just run away from this voice, you've got to combine them, and then he does. He literally says those things, he demonstrates it visually, and then verse 2 of the song does the thing. Quite literally, he does do the thing he just said. Um, it happens. You watch it happen. And it's portrayed as being uh, like a, a breakthrough. You know, this helps him sort of recover, or feel better. He stands up from the, the wheelchair, for example. Yes, um, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about this too much, but we also get a moment about seven and a half minutes in where he puts the guitar down and talks directly to the audience. Again, I would view that as being not part of the piece. It's just something he wanted to say. Cool and all, uh, but I don't have as much to say about it. Um, I, I think it, I would describe it as advice, and maybe we'll talk about it in part two. But uh, as a conclusion for the part one thing, yeah, I think that this is an interesting way to employ this format. It allowed me to focus on how this applies to artistic processes for various people making various types of media, media because this is a, a little bit of a hybrid, a little mini hybrid, little performance arty uh, for a music video, in my opinion. And also quite obvious, we'll talk about that more in just a minute. And so I was invited, I felt, to focus on how it applies to other media, 
I'm not spending my time trying to figure out what this piece means. That could po not possibly be much more obvious. <laughs> and so I'm invited to just think about its implications and how this song was made that way. Oh, he's literally doing that right in the piece. Okay. Hmm. And I found myself thinking more about myself and my own experiences with this kind of difficulty creatively. Uh, not the same as his, it doesn't sound like. But certainly a dark side of the mind telling you that everything you make is garbage and you're garbage and it's all just garbage. And then most of the audience doesn't see that because it would be kind of unwatchable if that was in the piece. Um, the, the topic of nobody wants to hear what you have to say is quite literally in verse one of the song as well, of course. Uh, that's what this piece is doing. So anything that I would say like that, he literally says during the song. So there's not much point in discussing that further. Uh, again, this is not going to be an interpretation of the song, uh, intentionally anyway, because there's not much to interpret. Like he essentially just says, this is what everything is. Um, so let's talk about that in part two, but I hope you can see my point that having the song quite literally demonstrate the, the tactic being suggested is pretty interesting. I think, I think that's cool. And it also invites the audience to think about how this applies to other creative work. When you see a creative piece, you know, this is likely going on behind the scenes. Now, part two, um, as true parlay grandmaster foot uh, and free William were talking about during the, um, during the in the comments for this parlay request uh yes it is quite obvious and you could take that in a few directions uh but my kind of thesis for this subject is that as somebody who spent a lot of time in poetry classes reading poetry uh and at coffee houses performing a bit of poetry mostly in college i don't much anymore and who took the English major more broadly at my liberal arts college which is like the best place to take an English major am i right uh I did not like it, um, I roll. <laughs> um, I am very familiar in a way that not, maybe not everybody will have experienced this as much, just how surprisingly impenetrable simple poetic prose can be for people. I think people have a tendency to, um, there's a sort of uh, mental blind spot that I would like to s gently suggest a lot of people have, um, and it is something like this you know that you are more into a subject than other people are. You're more comfortable with a complicated explanation of a build or like getting to grips with involved game mechanics. It's all in the name of fun. You're just very comfortable. You've grown very comfortable with them being pretty complicated. And you know that other people are not like that. Well, not all of you do, but you, hopefully you're <laughs> rapidly realizing that now. Uh, you you, it would be good to know that other people are not as com comfortable with that, of course. But my experience has been that people have this bias where when they know they have a bias, they slightly underestimate that bias, slightly or, or significantly. And so, in fact, people uh, are intimidated by those things much more than you think they are. You think they are, but not enough, basically. Um, I'm, I don't know your life. I'm sorry for saying you, uh, let's say me, uh, I've definitely experienced this before. Now I know about that bias, but personally, I think it just pushes it a level down. And I find myself frequently mildly surprised by how other people are like a fish out of water for subjects that I think, surely this is simple enough, right? No, like I have acclimated that to that more than I can really correct for, I think, um, it's difficult to do. But I think you can get there eventually. Um, and so in this particular example, what I'm referring to is interpreting lyrics. Basically, any remotely poetic sounding, even just rhyming, even just m mere rhyming, or things being fast, being spoken quickly, is enough for most people, and they kind of glaze over a bit and feel like, I, I don't know if I can do this. I think this comes from a lot of places. I think one of them is that there's some anxiety from doing it in uh, probably some very misguided English literature classes for a lot of people or whatever language you took those in, um, among other things. You know, you were meant to understand something you just didn't, uh, and, and the teacher was too open-ended about that. They said, you know, what does this mean to you? No, no, no. Like, <laughs> I don't think that's an effective way to teach that anyway. Uh, let's break it down a bit. So... I think that saying something uh, 
that you want to get through to the audience, if you want the audience to literally understand something, the piece is essentially addressed to the audience, even though in the in the world of the song, he's talking to himself inside of his head, in verse one at least, the piece is addressed to the audience. Uh, maybe you could say it's targeted at the audience. Um, and so if you want them to literally understand it, and what the piece does is provide advice and an example of that advice in use, then I think it is uh, not to be underestimated how valuable it could be for the, the, the goal of the piece, if you word it that way, to just say what it's doing. I personally, as an aside, believe this to be one of the reasons that rap is popular. It's common to say things in quite plain text, and this may be enjoyable for people that find it less penetrable and accessible to say them in a, in a flowery way. Um, you can say them in a way that sounds cool, that is one of the fun parts of poetry and rap, but with much less of an emphasis on not just saying the thing that you're saying in rap than traditionally in a lot of poetry. Indeed, there's a part of me that asks then what is even the point of metaphors or allegories? And I would say the point of them is for fun, but they're just not fun unless you've been uh, inducted <laughs> into poetry, which is I think one of poetry's biggest weaknesses, is if it's not clear to you that the goal is to have fun with the imagination that would come up with seeing this thing in the world as this metaphor. If the point is just like, that's just fun and I want to show you. If that isn't how it's presented, poetry as an entire enterprise is arguably pointless, rendered almost completely inert. Um, I have very little confidence in poetry as an art form, and one of the reasons is that it is so neutered with it, unless it's introduced effectively. Um, and you can't just put this poem is just for fun, I wanted to show you this fun thing on every single poem you write. Well, you could do that, but that's a topic for another time. <laughs> I think you get my point um, going on about that for a little while. Uh, it can be very effective to just say the thing. So I am not defensive as much as a, a, a little hostile toward the idea that it is bad for the piece to lack subtlety and imagination if you just mean it's the piece is literally saying what it means when uh i hope you don't mind me including you true parlay grandmaster foot um in this discussion uh, when you say a lack of subtlety and imagination i find myself feeling well hold on i mean that's that's innocent until proven guilty like that has benefits f for sure no matter what but doesn't necessarily have detriments uh, it's it's not bad until we demonstrate how it would have been bad uh, how it how it, the piece would have been better if it was worded differently, but it is automatically good. People automatically understand the piece much more, uh, and there isn't a clear drawback to me. But there might be unclear drawbacks. Um, yes, I think that the the one of the risks of the piece being so direct is that it is it's too direct. Um, it might be that metaphor and allegory used more heavily would be a way to engage with the subject in a more comfortable way. I think the subject of trigger warnings, content warnings, is useful to dig into in a little bit more detail here. You know, people who don't understand content warnings seem to usually, the most common misunderstanding I've seen, is that they think that it's about, like, not wanting to deal with dark subject matter, which sounds like what the point is, but isn't. Uh, people think of it as, you know, I, I'm just going to nope out of something that I don't like. That is not really the primary purpose of a trigger warning. Uh, the primary purpose is to let people for whom it would be harmful suffering for them to relive something hard they went through to escape that thing without needing to feel like, you know, I there needs to be an explanation or like a clear way out for me or something, uh, and they don't need to be ambushed by that. Uh, the, the point is not to merely avoid things you merely dislike. <laughs> it's about mental safety. I think if it was a physical injury, and for example, you were going rock climbing and people didn't have the shoes or had hurt their leg, people would never say like, oh, well, it's fine. Like you can just climb carefully or whatever. That would be insane. <laughs> this is essentially the mental equivalent of that. You need to say what the person is getting into because it is literally not safe. I think it's just because it's a mental thing that people don't aren't able to conceptualize that as much. 
However, I think that an interesting further dimension of trigger warnings is that it can be very effective to explore something that you're struggling with in a controlled way if you are comfortable. For example, I would imagine that this piece feels really good for people who have experienced the similar thing, but are comfortable tackling it in the moment that they see it. For example, I, myself, had a really positive reaction to this piece because I could relate to it and I am comfortable tackle like thinking about that subject matter. Uh, well, comfortable in as much as, anyway, it's fine, you know? <laughs> um, and so I, I appreciated it as a kind of controlled or structured way to engage with those thoughts, which I already like to do. Another example would be something like a tabletop role-playing game. If we go into a tabletop role-playing game and you say, I'm not comfortable with these topics, I would like to, you know, to be able to, you know, say, raise my hand if that comes up and say, I, I need to get out of this scene because I'm not okay with it, and I don't want to explain why because that would be just as bad. I, as your dungeon master, a game master, want to say, cool, good for you. And one of the side effects of doing that is you can now safely decide if you would maybe like to say, this is okay, let's go. If something comes up that, despite my best efforts, you find uncomfortable, but you have the free ability to, to leave the situation safely, you can now choose to perhaps not leave the situation if you would like. And I think this is an effective thing that covering these subjects can do. One of the things that may be challenging about having such literal discussion of the subject is that it may remove some of the defensive barrier that makes it effective to engage with these in a controlled way. Do you see what I mean? I don't know, this isn't my experience, but it's just something that makes me think if you're on the edge of being able to tackle this subject and kind of dig into it a little bit, work through something that's bothering you, saying it extremely bluntly might be a bit too much. I, that I could, I could understand if someone felt that way. So uh, that's one thing that comes to mind. Uh, again, my premise here is that I think it's good for the song to just say what it means unless we can demonstrate why there would be benefits if it didn't. And there is there is one. Another one is like, yeah, having uh, creating metaphor allegory imagery is fun. Um, I think you can do it in ways other than uh, other than w like with verbal metaphors. You know what I mean? Uh, I think that using the setting of the space as uh, a kind of inside of the mind was pretty cool. So the piece takes place in uh, sort of a concrete uh, chipped paint uh, room, some odd layout room with two lamps in it, two lit lamps. One of them is more toward the foreground with a, a pretty like reasonable, unassuming lampshade on it. And the other light is toward the background. It's dimmer. I would describe it as dimmer. It doesn't have a lampshade and is a little more brutally structured. I wonder what those could be a metaphor for. A very obvious metaphor, certainly, but it is a way to symbolize hope and despair, Ren. Cool. That's simple, but cool. The color of the paint in the room. I thought this was a nice touch. It's like that sea foamy color. You know what I'm talking about? The one that's in medical places, but makes me vaguely nauseous. Like I sort of hate that. <laughs> um, this sort of sea foam. It's not blue. It's not green. It's kind of no color. It's like the least natural color is how I often think of it. <laughs> um, the Or sometimes you see it as like scum on the water. Um, I really hate this color, um, but it really strongly evokes um, health and mental health in particular for me, for whatever reason. Um, the hospital gown that he's wearing is also uh, quite straightforward, which means it is basically that color. Um, they didn't do anything to make it like a different color or some stylized one. It's a quite transparent hospital gown. Um, I thought that was a very simple but nice choice and a simple use of something like metaphor or allegory. Um, does that count as as creative or using your imagination too much? Okay, I don't know, but I'm just saying like you, you know, the piece isn't putting no effort into those things. Um, I don't think it's good to be, uh, to over-engineer a piece's metaphor uh, if it doesn't need to be over-engineered. Particularly the way that the light hits Ren's face differently each of the two ways he faces during verse one of the song, pretty nice touch, a simple thing, easy to do. I think rather clever, uh, pretty cool. So, so that's one part. 
Um, and then, a, a, a true part like Grandmaster Fruit's second bit, the voice of empathy says that none of that matters if the audience actually listens to what you have to say. Sure, I mean, the concern maybe would be that people have a real bias toward effort. If something seems too literal, people tend to roll their eyes and go, ah, oh, like that's the same thing we've heard before. Ren in the song, this is how interpreting this piece is, literally says, you know, that's been done before by this and that artist. Um, I haven't, I'm not familiar with those pieces, but sure. I'm, I mean, I'm sure it has, right? Um, whatever parts of this piece. The, um, I guess the thing from my perspective is, first of all, uh, things don't get better if you put more effort into them. They don't. I mean, more effort might correlate with them getting better in some ways, but effort isn't valuable. Time and effort are not, I mean, they're valuable things in that we have a limited amount of them, but they alone do not make something inherently good. It's just that people have a tendency to listen when someone has kind of thrown those things at something, and you can kind of automatically force people to admit that you threw a bunch of resources at something if you have, you know, carefully worded stanzas or whatever. Personally, I think syncopated rap or spoken word does the same thing. So I'm not sure there's much of a problem there. Like, people will listen to you. Uh, they have the basic understanding that you put some thought into describing this this way. Uh, even if that is not a particularly valid bias that people have. Uh, obviously, we have to find some way to decide what to listen to in our endless media flood lives, and this is like, I guess, a basically functional way to do that or whatever. Um, so I don't know. I think that's fine. Um, I think that one of the reasons that uh, the, the empathy aspect of the piece works well and the audience listens to what you have to say, which I think they mostly will have with this piece, is that it is vulnerable it's close. It's quite brutal. Like, there's not much defense. I think wearing a hospital gown is not a bad way to demonstrate that. I really like that you can see the lavalier microphone on his hospital gown. Uh, I like it being an acoustic guitar. I like that he, like, looks nice, but doesn't have, like, an intense costume on or anything. I like that he has socks on. Like, these are nice bits of vulnerability to me. Um, and the fact that the piece is so transparently something he went through and clearly had a very hard time with, uh, I do think earns a good amount of faith from the audience that I want to share this thing. I think it's productive for me to open up about this, so let's just do it. Like, let's just do the thing. I made you a very pretty piece of music along with it. Let's go. Um, I, I think that's very nice. I think that's an effective way to say the thing. Now, this begs the question, are pieces that are not so direct now not being direct because they can't do those things? Oh, I don't know. Again, I think that the sort of cushioning thing about not saying it so directly does have real merit. That might seem like a small point, but I think there's really something there that I'm just not fully equipped to explore. I just think it's worth considering that this piece being so direct has a lot of value for a lot of people, an audience that is maybe underserved by a lot of current media culture that feels like things have to be less obvious or less direct, or that's it's not good enough, or who cares about that? Uh, nobody wants to just hear that thing being that way. When in fact, my personal experience is that to the extent that I can just shut up about that stuff and say I think this part of this game or whatever is cool, people like it. I feel like I've essentially never received a negative reaction from doing that. It's, it's all me. It's like 500% me saying that's that's nothing. Like, do, that isn't enough of a thing. Why would people care about that? When my own values staunchly denounce the value of thinking in such a way. Um, it's scary. It's it's messed up. Like, I completely relate to that feeling. Again, he very literally says that in the song. Uh, it's not about, you know, that stuff. Like, he's just trying to connect with people. Yeah, got it. Cool. Um, I will briefly discuss what I would what I described as the kind of advice at the end of the piece. He puts down the guitar and talks to the audience for a little bit, describing the relationship that he is suggesting in the piece between, uh, let's say, Hope Ren and Despair Ren as being an endless dance. And it is this dance that defines us compared to the angels and demons and gods that we might imagine, aspire to, fear, whatever it is. Uh, what defines us living as humans like this is that we are trying to combine and uh, mix together those two parts of ourselves. You can't just avoid one of them. 
it, it's kind of a topic for another time, I think, because you could tackle this subject by saying, okay, how does that work pragmatically as a way to deal with existential depression? I would say I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> um, I, I don't think it's bad advice. I'm not saying it like that. Just to say um, that's a, a not uncomplicated thing to discuss. I'm not going to be able to fit all of that in right here at the end. I will not try for now. An interesting topic, perhaps for another time. But I think it is interesting to note how this is a, a rewording and a bit of a, a bit of a departure from the way that the song covers this topic. He has said this piece of advice during the piece of music. Now, while he directly stated what he was going through mentally, he didn't exactly directly state, you know, you can combine them and then maybe that's a better solution, trying to, to get them to work together rather than be opposed. And it's like you're trying to avoid part of yourself. He demonstrated doing that with verse two, facing forward, uh, you see him kind of having completed the piece and play from the top again. But he doesn't literally say, you fuse together light and dark to make the, you know, the mighty mon morty morphing monstrosity or whatever. Um, and he does more or less at the end here, though I'll note that it is a little bit more of a metaphor, though, as a bit of a departure from the rest of the piece. I think there's a couple of things here. First of all, if you're trying to give advice, or it's weird to call this teaching, but you're trying to provide a, a piece of information that you think could be useful to people, it's not bad to take a wide approach and provide the piece of information in a few different ways. Demonstrate it, say it, maybe a rewording or a metaphor, a light metaphor. Yeah, point two, it's it's only a light metaphor. It's hardly all that difficult to understand what would be meant by letting the two voices be in an eternal dance rather than, I mean, a not eternal relationship that doesn't include both of them. I wonder what that could be in the context of the rest of the piece, you know, like <laughs> it should be fairly easy for the audience to understand, like, right, instead of, you know, giving it all up, you could maybe try to move forward like this. Um, I think that, that makes sense. Again, I, while it's not good to un overestimate such things, I think it's fair to say that's a relatively direct metaphor, not 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 the most inaccessible metaphor you could pick. And uh, I also think that coming closer to the audience, after having visually shown left, right, we combined into the center, I walk forward and tell you this thing, you sort of feel it a little bit. I think a lot of people who, there will be people who are lost about this part, and hopefully those people will still get a vague sense of, like, don't do this and that. Instead, you know, try to bring them together somehow. Uh, that's what I am suggesting. Um, but as a piece of general advice, I do have, I do have a mild criticism or sort of a, a food for thought, a takeaway. My my thoughts about this subject, and I have thought most of the things in, in this piece before myself, have often been distracted by how do I how do I word or describe this? You you can run from existential dread forever, in the sense that we currently don't live forever, and you can live in the world, like be a part of society without thinking about such things. You can and people do do that. You are physically able to do that. It is possible. I don't think it's it's workable. Uh, to me, it's not acceptable for me myself. I feel like you have to be ignorant of essentially the reality of the situation uh, to feel that way. But it's not like impossible to do, you know what I mean? It is a real option to just not think about these things. I don't think it's a good option, but not everybody has the time to deal with these things. My primary concern has always been that if you kind of put it off, at the end of your life, won't it come and ambush you and that will be very bad at the end? Um, but it's not something I'm considering doing because I can't stop thinking about these things. I am I would never have had the choice to just like put it off and not think about it. So to me, it's kind of a non-discussion for myself. I'm not making a decision about whether I think about these things or try to push them away. I can't decide. I, I have to do, you know, this one. And I, for one reason or another, I would philosophically defend that position. I think it's, it's better overall. You gain more by trying to dig into the dark thoughts rather than trying to put them off. 
but it's not like you can't put them off. Like it's impossible to do anything like that. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that this is a, a useful subject more broadly in any situation where you can pro it's undeniable that you gain things if you spend a lot of time thinking about it and getting your mind into a good place, but that's a very large, at least upfront, possibly ongoing cost. Making builds. I hope that doesn't seem weird. I'm not saying that as a, a silly throwaway joke. I quite literally think of it that way all the time. It is the same situation. People who don't have uh, the time to organize their preferences or build something that they would like better in a game, well, it's not benefiting them much if that is required to fully enjoy the game, is it? Now, it would be highly rewarding should they have the time to do those things. But depending on your circumstances in life, you likely don't have a choice about whether you have time with that or not. You do have time or you don't, period. And it's not really you like choosing to have more time to think about your existential depression and therefore come to a good relationship with it. You can't do that in most people's life situations. It's not, it doesn't matter whether it's beneficial or not. Uh, that you have to do one or the other for enough time that that's the one you're kind of stuck with. At least that's how it seems to me. Uh, and then even the people who do kind of have the choice, who do have enough time, I'll tell you, I certainly don't feel like I can choose to not think about it um, in any meaningful way. Um, I, I think about it all the time, every day. So I that doesn't... Hmm. The, uh, basically, there's a question about what advice does for this subject. You see what I mean? I'm not saying that it's bad or harmful that he's given some at all. Um, I not in the slightest. Uh, just that I think it's worth exploring what, like, what does it mean to give advice about this subject? Uh, can you actually use it uh, when you discuss builds or really anything like this? Where to get into it more, you would need to spend time you may or may not have to develop more of an opinion about it. What what does it? Where, where is the utility or what is the function of giving advice about such subjects? I hope that kind of makes sense. Anyway, uh, I thought this was cool. Thank you for recommending it. I had not seen this. I, I, have, I haven't seen such things. I, how you say, live under a rock with such cultural touchstones. Uh, so I was quite happy that you shared it with me. I thought it was cool. Um, I would, uh, it's fine, Free William, but I would like to hear more about what you think about it, for what it's worth. Um, I, it's perfectly fine, cool, good, uh, to have parlay that are really, really short requests like this, but I certainly don't mind if you say some things of your own and spoiler them out or whatever. Um, that's cool. Um, I, it, I mean, it's your parlay, you could do whatever you want. You probably don't want to hear about what you have to say about the piece. Uh, I admit, I selfishly, like, I just do. I do want to hear that. <laughs> so uh, for what it's worth, take that as an invitation. I, I like it when people uh, chime in on their own a little bit. But yeah, I can understand how for your own entertainment that it doesn't have clear value because, of course, you know what you have to say about these things. Uh, there's various different reasons people ask for parlay. Anyway, uh, thanks for the request. Thanks for the support. Talk to you soon.